The journey to the draft is driven by AAA. AAA, roadside is their strong side. Make AAA a part of your game day today. AAA, go ahead. With the 25th pick in the NFL draft, the Philadelphia Eagles select. You're listening to the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. Welcome to the Journey of the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. I'm your host, Fran Duffy, and we've got a fun show today. Senior Bowl in the books, all-star game process in the books. All that stuff's over and done with, so now... What's next? And that's really the the question that we look to answer here on today's show. As always, the best way to support this show, if you listen each and every week, go into Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, wherever you listen, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. That helps boost us up the rankings, make our show a little bit more available to anyone else out there looking for a podcast just like this one. On today's show, at the very top, we are joined by Ben Fennell, who's going to be with us every single week here uh, moving forward. Really, C-Mac and I, we're going to break down what, what's going on around the league right now? Because obviously, look, the Senior Bowl's over. We've got our draft buzz segment. We're going to talk through the fallout from the Senior Bowl. We'll dip into some underclassmen a little bit today. And that's really what we're kind of doing in this episode is we're going to turn the page from the senior class to the underclassmen. Now that we can focus in on the combine here in a few weeks, who are some of the players we want to have our eyes on? And that's what our pick six segment this week is going to be all about six players that we're excited to dig a little bit deeper into in, our, in terms of our study, getting ready for the NFL scout. Scouting Combine in February. After that, we've got some of your questions in our draft mailbag. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get right into it. It's time for Draft Buzz. Now it's time for Draft Buzz. All right, let's get things going here on Draft Buzz, guys. And, you know, the Journey to the Draft podcast, driven by AAA, takes on many iterations throughout the year, right? So uh, during the summer, we've got our series where we talk with different scouts and evaluators, and then we get into the fall, and obviously we get into our routine and how segments are structured. Now we get to this point, after the All-Star Games, and I wanted to kind of take a little bit of a different spin on Draft Buzz compared to what we usually do uh, this time of the year, where we're going to have, just like how we normally do in the fall, just kind of different segments within the segment, I'm going to do that here, and we're going to stick with Through the Grapevine, where we're going to hit on some newsworthy items here. And uh, At the very top, I mean, we'll, we'll react to the Senior Bowl. C-Mac, you and I just got back uh, mm-hmm. from Mobile uh, last week. Justin Herbert wins MVP of the Senior Bowl. 9 for 12, 83 yards, touchdown, 22 yards rushing, uh, won the practice player of the week as well. Um, to me, I think the biggest thing is, look, Justin Herbert kind of cements himself into that top 10, top 5, top 50. Any thoughts of him dropping past the Eagles, I think, are pretty much out the window at this point. Certainly agree. I mean, he showed everything that he needed to in Mobile, Alabama. has the size, the poise. Uh, the arm strength, ran the offense efficiently. And even when he came out of the game, the offense wasn't able to do anything. Even though they lost the game, yep. he did his part to keep them in the game for the short time that he was in there. So Herbert was was very impressive. And for my chance to see him up close and personal for the first time, definitely looked the part of, a, of an NFL quarterback. Yeah, I th- Ben, I know you've seen him live. This was our first opportunity to be able to see him throw. Very easy. Just everything looked really, really easy for him. And just to kind of temper his trajectory with the Senior Bowl week, he is the exact same player this week that he was all season. Of course, yes. Guys made catches for him. Yep. He was accurate. He's a strong arm guy. He has touch. You saw a little bit of functional mobility outside the pocket. Very easy thrower of the football. Yeah. Tons and tons of drops the past few years at Oregon. It was just nice to see some guys make some really tough grabs for him. Yep. Contested catches, come back to the football for him. That's what it's going to look like on Sundays. And if he has those types of uh, receivers on the outside... You could win games. So Paul Alexander, obviously he's coached by the Cincinnati Bengals staff down there for the South Squad. Paul Alexander, longtime coach out in Cincinnati. He's been on this podcast. He's been on the Eagle Eye in the Sky podcast as well. Uh, big offensive line guy. He's been an offensive line coach in the NFL for years and years and years. He tweeted out that Herbert to Cincinnati, that's not a, you know, that's not that's not dead. You know, just because Joe Burrow, everyone's penciling in Joe Burrow number one to Cincinnati, Joe Burrow number one. They could very easily, they coach this kid all week. They, maybe they feel comfortable moving back into the draft or just staying put and selecting Herbert at one. I think this week kind of opened the door a little bit for that to happen. If we're talking about shakeups at the top of the draft, I think that's a little bit of an interesting topic. It, it's There's going to be so much smoke going on over the next couple months. I mean, who knows? No one knows what's real except who's in that Bengals organization. Zach Taylor, Duke Tobin, who you know pretty much is their general manager there. Right. 
the fact that they got to see Herbert up close and personal, they know what they're going to get with him. They could, they have all the film on him. They know how he acted in the huddle. It, it's a lot of this stuff. And Fred, I know you try to watch some of this during the practices, yep. and you do when you go to the games on site. You try to watch the interactions with the players. You know, are they someone who's going to take charge? Do they have that alpha dog role? It, it's going to be some of those things that they saw behind the scenes that are going to help them make that determination. So, uh, to me, if the Bengals are going to go quarterback. I'm not getting cute and dropping back or doing anything like that. You pick a guy, you go with him, sort of like the Giants did with Daniel Jones last year. Right. People thought they, they could have dropped back and got him later in the draft. Don't mess around on a franchise quarterback. Don't mess around whatsoever. If you believe in a guy, you get him and you move on. Well, that's what that would be the thing is if now it's after spending that week with him, does he become their guy? Are, are they in love with Justin Herbert after having to spend that time? Because this it's not just, oh, they got to practice with them four times. They're in meetings. They're in the training room. They're in the locker room. They're in the meeting room. They're in all yeah. that stuff with Justin Herbert. So spending that extra time with him this week uh, could kind of, like I said, kind of open that door if they don't fall in love with Joe Burrow uh, over the rest of this process. Because now with Burrow, they'll have him in for the pre-draft visit. They'll have him for a day or two. And then they'll have him at the Combine for a 15-minute uh, official you know, uh, formal interview after, after that. That's it. So it's going to be interesting to see uh, you know, how that kind of shakes out. And this conversation was coming no matter what. Of course. Paul Alexander planted that seed right. of doubt. And that's what the Cincinnati Bengals should be preaching for the next three months is who are we going after and try to encourage a trade up try to encourage different values for the position. And it could end up being a Philadelphia Eagles sense where you get your guy at number two and another team wants to come up and maybe get the guy you think they were going to take at number one. So that whole cat and mouse of the prospects yep. with the quarterbacks, especially in Detroit sitting at three with the future of Matthew Stafford. Of course. Huge leapfrogging spot there as spot well. There. Yeah. I mean, at the comp, was it the combine last year where the Arizona Cardinals? Yeah. Preach their faith in Josh Rosen, exactly, yeah. and you know he's our quarterback moving forward. And now a year later, we see how that unfolds. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, so staying with the senior role, Dane Brugler, a friend of the podcast, uh, wrote a great article for the Athletic uh, talking about 14 prospects who made the most money in Mobile. And we talked about a lot of these guys last week, C-Mac. So uh, I wanted to bring up one name that we didn't talk too much about. Ben, okay. you've seen the guy live. That's Josh Uche, the, the linebacker, defensive end, hybrid uh, from Michigan. Uh, this is a guy who had a pretty good week. I know he had a good game as well uh, on Saturday. Uh, thoughts on, on Josh Uche overall? Well, what did we say before? Before going into the game. This guy was going to terrorize one-on-ones. He's a pass rushing demon. But where do you actually play him on early downs? He's a situational player. He's a pass rushing chess piece, a lot like Jannard Avery for the Philadelphia Eagles, who really struggled to play in first and second down. Really a sub package chess piece to uh, work into pressure packages. I knew he was going to look good on one-on-ones. Was very surprised to see him turn and run in coverage. Actually made a nice play in the post against KJ Hamler this year as well. So he has turn and run at Michigan as well. But he's a guy that looked good in practice, looked good in the game. Yep. Where do you play him? Yeah, I think that's going to be the big question with Uche. This guy that uh, certainly has that explosive trait you're looking for off the edge, ability to turn the corner. But and these guys terrorize this week all the time. Hassan yep. Reddick, Eric Stryker, uh, Ogbenyana, um, all these kind of Mar uh, Marquise Haynes. Yep. All those undersized guys always terrorize practice because they're unique, they're different, they're small, they're kind of that tweener hybrid player that give a lot of tackles trouble. Especially yeah. in those one-on-one -on -one no situations. Question, yeah. They're already yeah. designed for the tackles or the offensive linemen to lose to begin with. So I, I agree with Ben 100% on this. It's You can see the role. You see where he fits at the next level. It's just going to be how high is a team going to want to go up there to select him. But the traits are certainly there. He's definitely going to have a role for him in the NFL. And just really quick, just as much as Josh Uchi looked good at the Senior Bowl, Bryce Huff, University right. of Memphis. Shrine Bowl. Almost identical type of prospect, yep. undersized edge rusher, hybrid sure. piece, look great in trying week as well. And during the game, practices one on ones, very similar type of prospect. That's a good point. All right, so let's go to uh, another senior bowl reaction piece. Uh, ESPN.com did a piece where they pulled a bunch of different NFL scouts. Okay. Uh, and one scout told ESPN that Harrison Bryant, the tight end from FAU, could be, quote, George Kittle 2.0 in the NFL. And I think we're always trying to find uh, who's a comparison to the next big thing at any position. Thoughts on uh, on uh, Harrison Bryant to George Kittle? Man, George Kittle, that's that's a special comparison and trajectory. I do not see that. George right. Kittles don't grow on trees. That comes from a pretty special University of Iowa type of upbringing and development. I hope he turns into a Dallas Goddard right. in that he ended up being a really good, productive blocker in the pros. You didn't know that at college. He right. wasn't asked to block at all. 
sometimes you don't know what a player can or can't do because they weren't asked to do it. And that's Harrison Bryant, who's really more of a move player out in space in uh, Lane Kiffin's offense. So if he could end up being a Dallas Goddard, I'd be more than more than okay with that. George Kittle, if he can turn into a George Kittle, that'd be great. I just don't see that type of trajectory. K- Kittle's an all-pro. Right. I mean, we're talking about Kittle and you know Zach Ertz and Travis Kelsey. I mean, those are the three best tight ends. Generational type of game. guys, yeah. Outstanding, outstanding player, but not just the pass-catching ability, the ability with the yards after the catch and the athleticism. The blocking ability is just ferocious. <laughs> And I really didn't see that per se down there in Mobile, but you know, I, like Ben said, if he turns into a Dallas Goddard type player, that's outstanding. To be fair, uh, no one really was in on George Kittle uh, as the next George Kittle either, uh, as a fourth round pick uh, out of Iowa. Certainly not as a pass catcher. Right. You yep. saw the blocking in no Iowa. No question. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say their tight ends are featured in the pass game a whole lot outside of Noah Fant, particularly. Sure. But but I mean, Harrison Bryant, he was our practice player of the week. He was a tight end, so yep. he'd certainly flash. Yep. And he's in that conversation to possibly be the first tight end. To come off the board. Of course. In person, yeah, is he tight end, tight end, or is he a big receiver? Tight end, tight end. Yeah. Yeah, he looked he looked the part. Okay. I, I was pretty impressed with him. Him and, and Troutman, too, from Dayton, I thought had a really good week. Uh, you take the shirts off, take the helmets off. Oh, good. Claypool. All right. Harrison Brown. Yeah. Are we talking similar type of player? <laughs> uh, similar size? I mean, dude, I'll tell you what. Claypool, physically, Oh, like he looks like a, like he's he's a rocked up dude. Yeah. He looks like a tight end. Like uh, I wrote Devin Kajus right. and Riley Cooper sure. that you know right on the kind of border of receiver. He's rocked up. Tight end. Like he yeah. he looks the part. He's body beautiful. Yeah. So I, when you look at uh, a guy like that, uh, certainly we'll have that kind of discussion again. Last week, in case any of you guys missed it, uh, we were wall to wall in terms of our Senior Bowl coverage. So if you did miss it, you can go back. All that stuff's evergreen. We were recapping things uh, as much as we were previewing. So you can go back and listen to that at any point. Just go back to the last few episodes of the Journey of the Draft podcast. All right. Next segment I want to hit on every week here on Draft Buzz, Film Room Recap, where Ben and I will just kind of review a player that we've watched on film lately that kind of caught our eye. I want to, I want to go to you first. Uh, so a guy just that we've watched lately, just yeah. any, any any guy. guy. Man, I've watched so many players lately. You could, you could pick any position, any conference. I just got turned to this cornerback at a La Tech uh-huh. that was pretty interesting. And, you know, I really respect the All-American teams, of especially course. the AP they don't miss guys, and they're not just going off a of name value or school value. Sutton Smith, you load up the stat sheet at Northern Illinois, right? First team All American. Uh huh. Well, second team All American corner this year was Amik Robertson at a La Tech. I'm like, who is Amik Robertson? <laughs> 5'9", 183 junior. He's a three year starter on the field a ton, 2,500 snaps, tons of ball production, 14 picks, 34 PBUs. Yep. In a variety of schemes, I could show you a play. At a press man, off man, cover two, playing the nickel, playing number three, cover three. Really, really impressive player in a variety of schemes. Um, they really don't play corners over, so he'll play against some tight ends. He'll stick his nose in the run. He'll be a force player. Can play inside, play outside. Physical, physical player. Eight t- TFLs because yep. of that, no corners over. And a lot of times he has to stick his nose into the backfield there. Uh, really impressive kid. First team uh Conference USA, pro football focus, All-American. If he runs in the four threes, I literally see a Pac-Man Jones style of player wow. here. Pac-Man was also 5'9", 187. If it's in the four fours, could he be a Captain Munnerlin, a Buster okay. Screen? He's a small player. He's probably going to have to be a nickel at the next level. But I think he's he's got that toughness to him. He's got that edge to him, kind of like a Kenny Moore. Okay. Uh, the way he's carved out a role. The and nickel. Chris Harris, maybe? No question. Or even a Mike Hilton, the way he okay. came out of Ole Miss. But a really interesting player with production. And I'm just sorry I wasn't turned on to this kid earlier. Sure. He was a guy, uh, Lance Zerline, had talked about him on the show a couple of weeks back, uh, right before the end of the regular season, I believe, and said that he had just watched him and was really, really in on this kid. Uh, certainly a name to keep an eye on. I'm going to go with a guy that we've talked about a little bit on this show, uh, Ben, and that's Jalen Rieger, the wide receiver from TCU. Uh, we've talked about some of these guys that had high expectations coming into the year, but, you know, circumstances around them. Maybe, you know, the, the production wasn't always there. The the uh, execution wasn't always there. We talked about that with Jordan Love a lot last week, uh, the quarterback from Utah State. Jalen Rieger, I think, is another one of those examples where this year, I'll tell you what, like watching that offense, it was tough. That quarterback play was tough down there for CCU this year. So there were so many times where he gets quick separation, the ball was just so late getting there, whether it was velocity, uh, anticipation, the quarterback lacking both of those areas. The ball was contested where it didn't need to be, and he didn't get the, the didn't get the completion. Jalen Rieger, though, to me, is still a very dynamic, intriguing talent at the wide receiver spot. No question. I think uh, was played a little bit out of position there. They played him primarily at Z, a lot of outside the numbers. Yep. I tracked it. It was under 15% in the slot for being a 5'11", 190-pound 
kind of gadget player. Yeah. Didn't do him any favors and throwing a lot of verticals, a lot of red zone fades. True freshman quarterback, promising kid, but obviously took some lumps there with his accuracy and just seeing the game and getting the ball out. But I think in the NFL, much different style of player, I think, is what we're going to get. Love the clip that you posted on Twitter of Rieger attacking the football. No question. He does yeah. that really, really well. That's something and that's he had very, to because of that. the way that that, like, if he didn't attack the football, he wouldn't have caught any passes yeah. because he had to go up and go get it because the ball was getting there so late. And I just respect that kind of competitive mentality in a small package and that he's going to go fight for the ball, high point it, and come back to it, try to be that yeah. quarterback's best friend. Uh, and that was one of my issues with Hamler, a guy that I thought tried to find the end of the ball path too often, which you wait for it. That's extra time for a defensive back to get into the uh, the throwing lane and poke the ball away. Most of the time, you want to get the ball as fast as you can and pluck it out of the air and rip it away from the, uh, from the DB. We're going to talk about the comparison of those two guys a little bit later uh, in the show as well. Monte right. Rieger's son, former Eagle. That's right, former mm. Eagle's oh, son. Yeah, that's yeah. right, Monte Rieger's uh, son, Jalen Rieger. Um, all right, so another segment we're going to do every week. Big board breakdown, all right? And a little bit of a new one. We usually go through and say, all right, who's the, the latest top 50 list or a top 32? So we'll break one of those down every week and just see if there's something that kind of surprises us. So we're going to go with uh, our friend, another friend of the show, Daniel Jeremiah. His top 50 dropped last week when we were down in no, uh, Mobile. So we'll just think, what's a, what's a notable ranking that came out of that? C-Mac, I'll let you uh, take us off Kick here. Kick it off. I'll go quarterback Justin Herbert. I already talked about him, his performance at the Senior Bowl and last week. this was week. pre-Senior Bowl when he dropped this Pre-Senior Bowl, list. so wonder how much that'll change. He's yep. 21st on the list. So Love, you have someone yeah. who looks like he's going to be a franchise quarterback who has physically everything you want, has all the tools that you want in a quarterback. To me, he's played at a high level there at Oregon in the Pac-12. He was, again, not only the practice player of the week at the Senior Bowl, granted that this came out you know, after or this released before uh, the Senior Bowl, but still was a practice player of the week at the Senior Bowl, MVP of the game itself. Hard to see that a guy who's going to be a, a potential franchise quarterback who might go in the top 10 of the draft be 21st there in the overall prospects. Yeah, and I think this is uh, one of the things to remember, too, with these big boards. Now, DJ says it all the time is <coughs> D, uh, the top 50s are go with my eyes. The mock drafts, I go with my ears from what I'm hearing. So uh, certainly something to note. Ben, That's a good way to put yeah, it. What yeah, what was one of, uh, one of your big takeaways? I know you've got a couple here. His offensive tackles uh, is OT number one, Makai Becton. Yeah, from Louisville. Big guy, 6'7". You've done him, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, I haven't every, this every bit of 350 or whatever he's measuring in at. I just, interesting player, talented player, massive, moves yep. really well for his size. Really unique kind of player, too, because he plays with that staggered stance. So his outside foot is already back, and you would think most tackles want to get kind of depth. Sure. He's already out there. So it's kind of interesting his first step doesn't gain any ground, but he's so big, so long, you can't get around this guy. Can he end up being a you know, a Max Starks okay. type of player who is every bit of 6'7", 360 as well? That's kind of what you're hoping for, Orlando Brown. Brown. He plays a lot like the way Big V does. Okay. Just so big, you can't get around this guy. But I think he's just so limited scheme-wise. Very a few uh, perimeter action screens, pin pulls, any sort of athleticism to get out on the edge. I think it just limits your scheme. OT1 over Tristan Wirfs, Jedrick Wills. I mean, Andrew even, Thomas. Andrew Thomas, even Good Austin player. Jackson, yeah. Josh Jones. Did you see the things that uh, Paul Alexander said about Josh Jones? Yeah. Yep. Compared to, uh, to Walter Jones. Yeah. I mean, that's pretty wow. pretty high praise from a former offensive line coach that knows what he's talking about. Um, Lane Johnson's a big fan of Josh Jones's game. I yeah. mean, four four pressures he allowed all season long, Josh Jones. I've been watching more and more of him. That guy does not do anything wrong on the tape. He's a very impressive player. So when you were uh, turned to me, uh, I think in September or so, and yeah, said, watch like this that. kid. It was ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I think Becton's going to be a late first rounder, but he has him at 10th overall, his first tackle. I have some questions. And he went in the mock draft. He went four overall in the mock draft. Yes, to the Giants. Yeah. Which I have some concern there to the Giants. Are you getting another kind of Eric Flowers type of player? He does fit, I feel, what uh, we'll get him we'll in get him likes. Likes. Yeah, no question. Which is a good guy. So I like the fit there. Uh, but no, I think that's a, that's a very interesting name to bring up. I'm going to go with a name, Ben, that you and I both watched this kid back in the summer. Uh, Ross Blacklock, the defensive tackle mm, yep. from TCU. Redshirt sophomore this year. 
He missed all of last year, all of 2018. So you and I studied him going in, and we were like, yeah, like nice player. I haven't done this year's. I don't know. Have you done this year's film yet? Yeah, I watched a couple games. Like I know that DJ has him high. Mel Kuyper had him high. A couple other people that are you know that are renowned uh, analysts have this guy pretty high. Uh, he's got him 18 overall, which I mean that's another defensive tackle throwing in that first round mix. He's definitely one of these late bloomers in the process, just because of the injury last year. He's a yep. freshman All American. He's healthy. Just didn't look like he did freshman year, which he was a terror. Freshman yeah. All-American, some really impressive tape against Oklahoma, Arkansas, big offensive line. Stanford, he played as a freshman. A yep. bunch of cool games there. But uh, really interesting player, and I think he's going to kind of keep ascending. I'm glad he came out. I think he's ready. Son of a former uh, Harlem Globetrotter, that's if right. I'm not mistaken. Yes, kind of a cool, cool family background there, but a uh, good player. Yeah, TCU got, has a couple guys uh, this year. Certainly Blacklock, Jalen Rieger uh, at the top of that list. All right. The next segment we're going to hit up every single week, Mock Draft Roundup, where we're going to just break down a mock draft. We'll kind of go through who the, the analyst has the Eagles picking. And then one of the things I, I like, too, we did this a few years ago, C-Mac, was mm-hmm. who are the five that went before the Eagles and who are the five that go after? Because that kind of just gives you a sense of who we're talking about in this range. So the mock draft we're going to pick is one that dropped this week. That's Bucky Brooks from NFL.com. Has the Eagles selecting Colorado wide receiver LaVisca Chenault. Uh, this is a player, actually, that I, I just – we watched him over the summer, Ben. Mm-hmm. I watched him again this morning. I know you've watched him again as well. Uh, what are your thoughts on LaVisca? Interesting player. It seems to be one of the more – polarizing players as far as trying to project a fit. NFL comps for this guy are all over the place. All over the board. I've heard a lot of Sammy Watkins type of comps. I lean that way. Yeah, I've even heard some Andre Johnsons of the world because he's thick. He's big, but he can run. Uh, A bit of a gadget player. He can also win vertically. See Cordell Patterson? Yeah, Cordell Patterson, that type of mold player of a kind of a do-it-all type of player. People are looking at what Debo Samuel's doing for the 49ers. No question. I mean, Debo is 5'11", I think 215. This guy is 6'2", 220. Yeah. So much different style of package there. Um, left a little bit to be desired this year, uh, to be honest. For Didn't what, have a great year. For what he did in the previous two years in the production, I think the expectations are pretty high with a veteran quarterback in that offense. I think... Uh, he didn't really live up to standards there. And obviously the injury history, the workload, there's a lot of concerns that go around this kid, but he's a dynamic player that's put a lot of good stuff on tape and you're hoping that that good football is is who he is. Yeah, he's a, a really, really intriguing prospect because of the build, the movement. He's expl- He's going to run in the, probably the high 4.4s, maybe low 4.5s at 220. That's a really, really impressive physical specimen. Uh, the injuries certainly give you a little bit of a pause, and it hasn't been anything really serious. I think. I mean, he had the labrum last year, but uh, outside of that, it was like a toe. This year was a little bit of a core muscle deal that he missed a game and kind of worked through it. But I think when you look at LaVisca Chenault, you're looking at a big-bodied kid who can get in and out of breaks, can work down the field. He's just got to get a little bit more consistent as a route runner. I like to see him get a little bit better playing the ball in the air, tracking it over the shoulder, things like that. But uh, certainly has a lot of tools to work with. In the NFL's flavor for these receivers – the six four six five guys are getting phased out of the NFL. You can't separate. They really can't run that well. You want easy offense. And that's the package of receivers that are easy offense. The Debos, the Gadgets, the Yaks, the guy you could put in the backfield, quick perimeter action, the gadget plays, the screen game, the vertical threat, the returning. Put the ball in this guy's hands and generate offense for us. And I think easy offense type of receivers – that's that's Sonal, and I think he's still going to get bumped up over the Colin Johnsons, Michael Pittmans of the world. Seeing how San Francisco has used Debo, the, the, like even just going back to the NFC title game, uh, all the orbits, the reverses, mm-hmm. lining up in the backfield, shallow crosses, screen game. That's him all day. No like that's a, yep. You get him into a role like that, he can really do some damage uh, with the ball in his hands. The five that went before the Eagles, and we're going to hear about these teams all the time in this segment, Atlanta took uh, Kayla Von Chasen, the, the outside linebacker, uh, pass rusher from LSU. Dallas took Henry Ruggs. Uh, Oakland took C.J. Henderson, or Miami took C.J. Henderson. Oakland took linebacker Kenneth Murray. And Jacksonville took Alabama corner Trayvon Diggs. So we're talking uh, – Two corners, the speed receiver, an athletic pass rusher, and a rangy linebacker going right before the Eagles uh, select a 21. Any thoughts on on those five players? Uh, those are positions, you know, you look at edge rusher Chase on, I think is a, is a very intriguing prospect. Yep. You know, edge rusher is something that the Eagles are always going to look to try to address, to try to fortify and, and you know, build up through the draft. Yep. So 
That's going to be a position of interest. Ruggs is a popular mock draft pick for the Eagles, so a lot of fans are probably going to be disappointed, especially if they hear he goes to Dallas of all places, right. which could lose Amari Cooper. Uh, certainly that's going to be one of intrigue there. So no surprise seeing that receiver is going to be mocked to the Eagles. And the way you describe uh, Debo Samuel, the way that he's utilized, yep. the Eagles could use that type of player. That, yep. You know, with Chenault. So that's why it's an interesting fit there. You've seen all five of these guys live, Ben. Yeah, I think I've seen most you've of them. Seen Ch- you've seen Chasen, you've seen Ruggs, Henderson, Kenneth Murray, Trevon Diggs. You've seen all those guys live. Uh, so it's, it's kind of interesting just looking at that group. Obviously, five very talented players. That's why I, I like to look. It's not just about the one guy that they've got pegged to the Eagles. Who else is being talked about You know, in that top 15, top 20, top 25? The five right after the Eagles pick. So Buffalo taking A.J. Epinesa. I know you've been tweeting a lot about Epinesa, yep. the pass rusher from Iowa, Ben. Uh, New England taking Alabama safety Xavier McKinney. I haven't done McKinney yet, but always flashes when I watch Alabama on TV. Jordan Love from New Orleans, or, or to New Orleans at 24. Got to think he goes higher than this, at that, higher than that at this point. Minnesota taking Grant Delpit, the free safety, and Miami taking dynamic running back DeAndre Swift. Any thoughts? Uh, I'm just on those interested five guys? to know what receivers went before Henry Ruggs. Did right. CeeDee Lamb come off the board? I'm assuming Judy's off the board. Having um, listened to Bucky, my guess is CeeDee Lamb, two. Jerry Judy were definitely off the board at that point, going into the top 15. And that just kind of opens up the conversation for style of receiver that this Eagles offense would prefer. And whether it's that gadgety Chanel or whether you want a waking up in the morning, running Pure a separator. four or three, yep. KJ Hamler type of guy with horizontal speed, vertical speed. You have to cover, cover every ounce of grass with a player like that. Um, I think it's more of that style of player I think uh, Eagles fans are looking for. Yeah, it's uh, it'll be interesting. The, the receiver discussion is going to be a lot of fun to follow over the next week because there's just, you know, we, we can already hear the, the analogy. There's so many flavors of ice cream, right? I mean, there's so mm-hmm. many guys uh, in this class that offer differing skill sets uh, that, you know, uh, that every NFL team will, will look to add to their offense. All it, right. it makes me think of back to your, I think it was your eagle eye discussion with Greg Cosell. Was it last year about the big receivers? Right, yep. It was last year at the Combine. Yeah, last year at the Combine. Yeah. Where, like, that comes comes into, into uh, discussion here about what are teams going to be looking for and the sure. different types there. Yeah, I think when you look, when you look at just what team uh, like there's there's uses for all of these receivers and how do they fit and what can you do. It's all about all right, like if you draft a, a KJ Handler or a uh, Jalen Rieger or Henry Ruggs or Jerry Judy or CD Lamb or LaVisca Chenault or T Higgins like they all have different skill sets. How are you going to use them uh, in your offense? Obviously, all of them are very talented. It's how you leverage their yeah. skill sets uh, to be able to you know, move the football, put points on the board. All right, uh, let's get to the next segment now. Pick six. We're going to do six underclassmen that we are excited to learn about. That's up next. Now it's time for pick six. All right, so pick six this week. We're going to do six players. Now that the All-Star games are in the rearview mirror, Kind of focus. You and I will be focusing on underclassmen now more so. See, I know Ben, you've been uh, going like wall to wall looking for the, the, looking through these underclassmen. Ninety nine guys officially uh, that were out that uh, got early eligibility uh, were announced. It was on last Monday, Monday of Senior Bowl week. That official list came out. So I'm going to lead us off here, and I'm going to go with LSU linebacker Patrick Queen. Uh, ben, I know you've seen this kid live. Mm-hmm. Uh, from what I can tell. Rangy, explosive, sideline to sideline player. I haven't done him yet. I'm excited to dig more into Patrick Queen because he's getting a little bit of buzz now as a top, you know, first round pick, maybe you know, at worst top fifty. Yeah, I think he's a really intriguing value, especially what he can do on third down and coverage. Yeah, doesn't look like a long, rangy linebacker, but really good coverage instincts. Sniffs out tons of screens. Can uh, man up on a running back in the flat. Can run with him on a wheel. Yep. Pretty good uh, PBU on Najee Harris on an angle route which is pretty impressive from a linebacker. Tough kid, explosive kid, small, rocked-up type of guy, but he's a, has really explosive foot speed. Interesting. Every now and then, he's a tick late, yep. but once he sees it, he really flies, and he gets there in a hurry. So uh, explosive player. I think he's going to test really well and try to sneak into maybe the back end around one. I like that. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to dig into him. I haven't done him. I haven't done Kenneth Murray yet. Uh, a couple of these junior linebackers are, are getting a lot of love. We've a lot done, of different styles of yeah. these linebackers, you know, too. Isaiah yeah. Simmons, obviously. You and I have done uh, a lot of work on Simmons. All right, uh, Ben, who's, uh, who's your first one here? Uh, I really want to talk about Isaiah Hodgins okay. from uh, Oregon State. Sure. He's a junior coming out, underclassman. I comped him to A.J. Green. And really? You he think looks, he moves that well? And I have kind of a hybrid comp of players in this class. Okay. He really reminds me of Justin Jefferson and T. Higgins put together. Wow. He's 6'4", 209. So we're talking tall, yeah. skinny, long limbs. 
Justin Jefferson's also tall, skinny, 6'3". T. Higgins, Higgins more than 6'4". Yeah. Justin Jefferson, electric route runner in and out of breaks, releases. T. Higgins, more of a catch point body control guy. See, Higgins reminds me of A.J. Green. So you putting this on Hodgins, Hodgins is really interesting. I think is both of those because oh, I think wow. he plays above the rim really well, adjusts really well, catches the ball away from his frame really well, yeah. wins and contested catches really well, good in the red zone, one drop on 86 catches this year. Wow. Really, really loose route runner. That's the first thing I wrote down. Really? For a 6'4", 210-pound oh, guy. Long legs, sudden movements, double moves all over the place. Spot and go, slant and go, stutter go, blaze out, which is like a post corner. Yep. Um, huge production, 86 catches, 1,100 yards, 13 touchdowns, 52 grabs of 10-plus yards. That was eighth, eighth most. Comes from a football family. His dad, James, uh, played in the NFL with the Cardinals, Jets, won a Super Bowl with the Rams. Yeah, so was, he a, was he a fullback or yes. a tight end? Yeah, fullback. Yeah, I remember, yeah. yeah. Um, so I'm talking the A.J. Greens. I wrote Martavis Bryant, Javon Walker, wow. Chris Chris Henry. So he like he can run. He can he separate. He can run. This guy can move. He's wow, a really right. intriguing athlete. Good production. Very nice. I was surprised to see him come out. Also a pretty interesting quarterback out there. I think his name's Jake Luton. Okay. L-U-T-O-N. He's like six seven, big arm, effortless type of thrower. Uh, I'm not really sure if he's a prospect, but this kid's really, really interesting when you put it on his tape. Oh, wow. all right. Well, let's, uh, let's go to another receiver here. Now, are, you are you clouded, though? If you're going to go and like well, watch I, him on tape now, well, it's like— the thing is that I had a preconceived notion. You know, I've, ta I've talked to some people uh, even on, on this show that are like, oh, he, he can't run. He's, he's going to be a late day three pick. So I kind of thought, oh, he's going to be kind of a, a big stiff. Uh, now off bed, off bed, I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm going to watch him today. Like, I'm, I'm excited I'm not sure about he's going to test. He's got really long legs. And right. a long, I don't know if the long stride is going to do him any favors as yeah. far as like running the 40. But that size in and out of breaks and the double moves, you don't traditionally see that style of right. like his legs kind of getting in and out of breaks like that. Very much the way A.J. Green plays. Interesting. I mean, interesting. Who told you that – you don't have to name names, obviously, but who told you that he's the one – you know, you're going from one end of the spectrum to the other. It's yeah, I'm like, not going to get into names, but yeah. yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I went with the receiver. I went with Chanel. We talked a lot about him in the first segment. Uh, very interesting backstory on him. He came from the same high school as Jalen Mills, yep. DeSoto, Texas. Father died about 11 years ago in a tragic hit and run accident, not, not too far from uh, AT and T Stadium down yeah. there, or where the site at the time, where the site of uh, where the Cowboys Stadium was being built. And then after that, his mother contracted the West Nile virus, yeah. a debilitating form. Hospital for a year. Yeah. Right? So you know, it was really crazy. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, so it's been through a lot. And mother, you know, athletic background was a D3 college basketball player. So. Um, it was more from the backstory, the fact that every, everyone's going to be wondering about wide receivers and the Eagles, all that combined. And after his, dad, after his dad had passed, he let his hair grow and he doesn't cut it uh, in memory of his dad. Yes. He was not allowed to play high school basketball because the coach didn't allow uh, long hair on the team. So the, he was like, oh, well, I'm not cutting my hair. And so they left him off the team, yeah. which is crazy. But and, like, he, and he's a junior. So yeah. his father is LaVisca Sr. Yep. And he's LaVisca Jr. So. Yeah, it's a, a very interesting backstory. These hair sure. rules in high school. That's ridiculous. You're not paying yeah. green. Ridiculous. Let, let people cool. wear it. Mean, it's ridiculous. Having, you know? but, uh, all right, so I'm going to go to another guy. No offense, uh, Jalen Mills. I mean, keep the green hair. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, Ben, there's another guy I know you're high on, and I'm excited to do him, is Missouri defensive tackle uh, Jordan Elliott. Ah, uh, Jordan Elliott. So I've heard yeah. great things about him. I, w I want to take the floor here. Tell you, tell me why I should be excited to watch Jordan Elliott. He's like Ross Blacklock in his trajectory right now, okay. just being kind of slow in the slow in the process as far as national spotlight. I don't even remember Terry Beckner told you last year. Oh yeah, he told me. Yeah. Oh yeah. He's, so he was one of the guys at the combine where I was like, oh, who's who's going back? That's big. And he said, oh. He's, he's, Watch out for this kid. I love that you do that. I put more value in that than like anything else that you do. Oh, I don't care you. what you see on tape. <laughs> right. <all> right? Perfect. <laughs> but the fact that you get Terry Beckner's quotes, all right? I got a lot of from the senior ball, but um, yeah, I should hold them now for you. But this is actually a Texas transfer. Yeah. So a high recruit that had a, a kind of an awkward college career and transferring uh, from the Big 12 over to the SEC, University of Missouri. One tech, three tech. Really reminds me of a Marcel Darius or a Sheldon, uh, Sheldon Richardson style of player flies upfield, plays out of this track stance and really right. shoots across the line of scrimmage. Great get off, laid on his feet, makes plays out to the numbers like Fletcher Cox. Wow. And I wrote that down as well too. Very active What's player. What's the weight? 
Uh, six four three fifteen. Wow, he was okay, a redshirt junior, kid. so we're gonna have to wait to get that confirmed. He might be a little closer to like three oh five. Okay, uh, it looks like he moves pretty light on his feet, but got great rip moves. He can hold his gap and hold his block at the point of attack. He can win up field of quickness, active hands, good eye level, always looking for the ball carriers. Really productive player. He's a second team All American, so he's a guy that had the production, had the notoriety as yep. far as the people know what they're looking at. And if you look at all sorts of uh, kind of credentials right now. PFF mock draft had him 25th overall. Right. So that's PFF Mike, who their lead draft sure. analyst, a guy we, we both respect. Better PFF grade than Kinlaw and Derek Brown. Wow. He was the highest graded interior defensive lineman in the country. Yeah. 90 plus grade in the run and the pass, the only guy. So uh, if you kind of value the grades from the PFF guys, he's a guy that's that's been up there. Yeah, I'm excited to, to dig into him uh, and what he can bring. Uh, who's your second guy here, Ben? So my second guy here is, I think we need to start talking about Thaddeus Moss. Okay. A uh, tight end from LSU, obviously Randy Moss's son. Interesting player. I think everybody wants this kind of mismatch player uh, that can run. He's a fluid runner. He's not super explosive, um, but he can run. Uh, I don't think he flies in and out of breaks, but he's a good body. He has decent hands. Most of his yak is kind of from bad tackles, though. I don't right. think he has tons of juice in the open field. He's right, not going to make him looks, miss. Yeah. Um, you know the the comp that uh, that DJ had thrown around on, on the Move the Sticks podcast was a Jermaine Wiggins. Jermaine Wiggins was enormous. He was, was like giant. I, I thought yes, Jermaine, Jermaine, Jermaine Wiggins was like two eighty or something. Yeah, he was a big boy. But um, Moss is like he's like a thickly built kid. I was like just his, talking about him last night with my buddy, and that he's not angular. He's right. really built like kind of a refrigerator. Is, yeah, uh, but he's only six three two forty nine. Huh. So once you get to those names, I wrote down Fred Davis, Randy McMichael, Aaron Hernandez. It's really that style of player. But I mean, Aaron was much looser in the open field. I started thinking back. I was watching uh, some old Peyton Manning. Do you remember Julius Thomas? Sure. Who was he? Was six five, a little bit taller. Yep. But he was really a block of a tight end he was as a well. Co- wasn't he a college receiver? Yeah. So, so and he really State? didn't move particularly well. Yeah. Deliberate routes, and that's what down with Thaddeus Moss. Really deliberate. He's patient. He breaks down. He gets himself open. Uh, he's a competitive blocker. He's tough. He's not going to overpower people, but he loses slowly, which is something we always talk about with sure. tight ends. Um, I just question if he can win against man coverage and question if he can win against NFL safeties there and it, kind of wondering what his athleticism is. Also, an NC State transfer. A yes. lot of people don't realize Correct. Yep. Uh, start his career at NC State. Uh, so the guy that he played ahead of, and I know Stephon Sullivan from LSU was more receiver than he was tight end. Right. Dude, Sullivan had a good week last week. He did, like, yeah, flashed across the board. He, he had a good week. Nice grab in the red zone there, yeah. soft hands. Yeah, he has, he's, he's, he's a big kid, too. He's a big kid. Uh, C-Mac, I know you spent yeah. some time with him, too. Mover. Yeah, no question. Very good. Uh, C-Mac, who's your last guy here? Uh, we talked about him a little earlier in the mock draft segment, uh, Caleb and Chase on from uh, LSU. Mm. And the thing with him, came back from an injury Yep. Uh, in 2018, had four and a half sacks final four games this past season, about 6'4", 250, can fly off the edge. Uh, a couple of interesting things background-wise, academic honor roll selection uh, for the SEC was all first-team coaches selection this season and wore the famed number 18 jersey right. at LSU yeah. that Benny Logan had once upon a time, uh, which shows basically epitomizes everything about the LSU Tigers They program. wanted to give it to Cushenberry from last year, but he's not allowed to wear it in a game because offensive the line, line rules. Yeah, he, I think he only wore it in practice. Yep, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, no, that's I didn't know that about Chase. He wore 18. That's good to know. All right, so I like that. He's a that. good player. He's got, you've done him. Very, done very him technical. He could win high side with speed, but he has a variety of moves, long arms, spin moves. And he's really loose, double right? Double hand like he's swipes, can set the edge. Uh, he's a little bit undersized. Right. He's he's in that same class of like Daryl Taylor at Tennessee, okay. and they might struggle against the run on early downs. That's right. But I've he, heard that's not. You just can't yeah. take him off the field. Right. A uh, really productive player. Tore his ACL in the opener last, last year. year. Yeah. Almost like fought his training staff. He didn't want to get stretchered off or carted off. Uh, walked off the field. It was kind of a tough injury, but sure. really rebounded. All right. Well, let's uh, let's put this put this one to bed. We're gonna go now. We've got a couple questions to answer for you guys at home. It's time for draft mailbag. Now it's time to hear from you, the fans, in the Draft Mailbag. All right, so as always with Draft Mailbag, best way to help the show out is to go on to Apple Podcasts or Stitcher. Leave us a rating. Leave us a comment. If you ask a question, we'll answer it here uh, on the show in this segment. Uh, The first one is actually one that I answered last week, but I wanted to get Ben's thoughts on this, uh, especially because in the comment they asked for Ben's uh, Ben's thoughts. So the scouts doubt. Five-star review. Hi, Fran. What are your and Ben's thoughts on K.J. Hamler and Jalen Rieger in the pros? Is Hamler exclusively a slot guy due to his size? Does Rieger project as a possible first-rounder? 
Yes, Jalen Rieger projects to a possible first rounder. I, so too, I, I do agree. not think he will be a first rounder. Okay. I think he goes in day two in that run on skill players like we had last year. I think there's going to be all the tackles that get pushed up. Yep. I think all these interior linemen that we started talking about, the Jordan Elliott's, the Blacklock, they're all going to get pushed up. Not a super deep class, deep at receiver. Handful of quarterbacks go, for. It's going to be a go. mad yep. dash on running backs and receivers on day two. So I think both these guys are day two players. Okay. But just to differentiate who these guys are, K.J. Hamler, small, small player, 5'9", 170. He's Deshaun Jackson's size. He's Deshaun Jackson's speed. Electric in and out of breaks, electric releases. Really sudden, yep. The one thing that pains me to write down is I don't know if he's a natural pass catcher. See, I think he tracks it really well down. I think he does as well, too. Yeah. But I've already struggles in contested catch situations. He yep. can struggle. Yep. He struggles over the middle of the field. He struggles to be a quarterback's best friend. He's not going to be that slot receiver that makes the the junk catches. He's not going to be that Edelman no. for you. He's the he's the guy that it's, he's going to have a couple clunkers. He's going to have a couple bad drops, but then he hits the home run. You're hoping he turns into yep. what Will Fuller is Correct. for the Houston Texans, who yep. also doesn't have natural hands. So it's for all intents and purposes, horrendous at Notre Dame and catching the ball. Yep. Um, but he wakes up in the morning running 4-3, an electric, electric player. Yep. He might be a guy that you just hand him the ball and say, go go get some yards for sure. us. Sure. Um, Jalen Rieger, I think a much more of a confident player. He also has some drop issues he did have at drops. TCU. Yep. Both years, yep. Um, but I think where they played him in relation to that didn't do him any favors. A lot of verticals outside the numbers, being 5-11, didn't do him any favors there. Um, but a player I would much I feel much more confident in making a traditional slot receiver in the NFL versus KJ Hamler, who I think will be more of a Taylor Gabriel vertical threat. I think both guys can be what's the, the best way to say that? I would say I think both guys can be very effective for the right coach in terms of like they could be, I don't want to say Tyree Kill, but be a very dynamic weapon for the right offense. Either way, I think they both can find roles for mm -hmm. any team because I think when you look at Hamler, I like the the, the Taylor Gabriel uh, comparison and that he can be that guy. He could be a little bit more, but I think with both guys, get the ball in their hands, let them be dynamic. Uh, I like both guys a lot. Um, yeah, and you see the way guys like Darius Slayton was used for you know the Giants this year. You can craft speed on the field, you know, yep. uh, in a schematic no sense, and that he doesn't necessarily have to be an every down receiver, the sixth round. possession receiver, and things like that. Yep. KJ Hamler's gone way before the sixth yes. round, but just figuring out what he can do for you in NFL offense. I don't think he's going to be that high volume third down receiver for you. Right. I agree. I would agree with that. I think that he's a. But a it's a shame kind of player, because yeah. he gets open like that. Yes. He exactly. is electric in and out of breaks. Yes. Just watch this guy get in and out of breaks. He carves up corners. But that, for every one that he does, he'll drop the pass on the other end, which the, is disappointing. Yeah, he, the, both guys, I think, have a couple of drops on the resume. It's about just getting through that. and get Can they get make the home run for you? Yeah. Uh, be that home run threat for you on the on the outside or from the slot. All right, next question. Uh, right him, left a five-star review. Uh, said, hey, Fran and Ben, welcome back, Chris, to the show. Great to always hear from all of you guys. I wanted to ask you guys, who are some of the athletic corners and safeties in this draft that are similar or remind you of a DRC? And I know C.J. Henderson from Florida is probably one, but are there any others? So I think the que the DRC question I think is interesting in that this guy was an athletic phenom. I would see like I don't know how many corners you've seen come through this building that have been more physically gifted than at DRC that size, at that too. size. That's that's, that's the, the thing. thing. Yes, I mean, no question. You know, you look at right now, Ronald Darby is very physically gifted, but not, he's still but, even still not DRC, but like. not to that level and not to that size yep. too. It's just a unique frame and a unique backstory where he's playing at Tennessee State, running on the track team. It, it's very difficult to find a comparison to that. So yeah. the one I came up with, I want Grant Delpit okay. of LSU. When you're looking from a side, I went from the size standpoint, mm -hmm. from the ranginess standpoint. Uh, there, when when DRC was coming out of Tennessee State, there were some people who thought he might be a free safety, right? And he's kind of been a hybrid later in the la well, Labrador's nickel, career. Yeah, sure. yep. You know, did a little little bit in the slot. He did some safety, I think, when he was with the Giants. So he has sort of that versatility. And some people thought he was going to be that from the jump. So uh, that's the closest thing. It, I was trying to see if you could find like, is there a small school with someone, someone with a track background? There's some people with the track background, but the factor in the athleticism and the size, it's it's very difficult to find. But DRC went. You know, right around where top a lot of people 10, think that 15, yeah. you know where people think Delpit's going to yeah. go. You know that mid first round. So, uh, so I went with Delpit on that one. Ben, who you got? Anybody? Got all sorts of names here. Uh, I, I'm sure. But what I'm are sure we? What are we talking about with a DRC player? So we're talking a six one corner. Yep. About 190 pounds. Okay. 
Long limbs, yep. long legs. He was tall. He was tall. I mean, he was like six. He was like six two. You might even like talking six, six two yeah. type right. of player. But at least six one. Yeah. yeah. Every bit of sub four four. Yes. So he's waking up running four three. No yep. You know, he's brushing his teeth fast. He's just one of those guys. Man coverage type of corner, recovery speed, the whole deal. Which this paints the picture of C.J. Henderson perfectly. Really quickly. No like, question. C.J. Yep. Henderson looks so. I've never seen a corner that has that combination where he's like he's tall he's long explosive fluid twitchy like I didn't study DRC coming out of Tennessee State that was a little bit before I started really diving into the tape of college kids this kid I mean he looks exactly like it CJ Henderson he's so. got the long neck and everything everything matches his helmet sits the same way yeah, yeah, like visually he just looks yes. like DRC but I have a couple names in that fit this mold a couple interesting ones too so Chris Claybrooks, University of Memphis. We talked okay. about him in the summer yeah, because right. he had to fill in for an injured TJ Carter in the bowl game okay. against Cincinnati. He ran 4-2-5 in walk-on tryouts last summer. He's 6'1", 180. Same mold, same speed. Probably not as gifted as a cover player. Sure. Um, but in that size and speed, the Clemson corner, A.J. Terrell. Okay, yeah. He's going to run 4-4s. Four Can he get into the 4-3s? I don't know, but he's a long, lanky corner, skinny limbs, 6-1. He looks like DRC kind of walking walking onto the field. Sure. I don't think he's as gifted as a, as a cover player as of DRC. Course. There's other guys, Lamar Jackson. Okay. Nebraska, long, every yep. bit of 6-2. I don't think he's as fast and explosive. That's the question, yep. Um, so that's why I brought up Clay Brooks right away because he has the official registered 4-2-5. Yep. And the six one size, the long limbs. That was an easy one there. There's guys that remind me of it size wise. Mark Gilbert at Duke, um, Amari Henderson at Wake Forest, right. Luke Barku, an underknown underknown Shy game. Guy. Yep, six one, one seventy five at a San Diego State. Kind of looks like a DRC player. I just don't think he, these guys have the four three speed. So, like C Mac was saying. Tough to find that perfect mold. So unique. Yes. So unique. That's what made him special, and that's what made him, you know, obviously hang around the NFL for 10, 12 years. If we're just talking about hyper-athletic players, like in the secondary, I went to the safety spot. Ashton Davis, to me, is, is one of the yeah. guys that's really, really Track impressive. Star. He's yep. so fluid, explosive athlete, just really natural, really easy. Uh, I still, I always go back to that interception he had against Oregon from the slot. Yeah. Uh, but even just kind of see him in person, you could see he's got that build uh, to be that kind of an athlete. Uh, so I went with Ashton Davis as a guy that I, I definitely wanted to bring up. So uh, great question there uh, from Write Him. Again, best way to support the show, Apple Podcast, Stitcher, leave us a rating, leave us a comment. After that, uh, guys, that'll do it. Uh, this That'll do it for this week on the Journey of the Draft podcast, driven by AAA. Hope you guys all enjoyed the show. We will catch you next week. We're getting closer and closer to combine time. Excited to uh, show you all the coverage we'll have from Indianapolis. But until then, we will see you next week right here on the Journey of the Draft podcast, driven by AAA.